pull this up. So with us today, we have um, Dr. Logan Strother. Uh, he is an assistant professor with the political science department in the College of Liberal Arts. He holds a doctoral degree from Syracuse University and specializes in American politics and public policy. Today, he's going to be speaking on group effect and support for civil liberties in the United States. So thank you. So thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to sharing some of my work with you guys and uh, getting feedback on uh, the parts of the project that are, are still in process. Um, so uh, as Amy said, this um, the project uh, that I'm presenting today, it's called Group Affect and Support for Civil Liberties in the US. Uh, the premise for this project, oh, sorry, I actually have a slide deck. Um, can I share my screen? Yeah. Okay. Do you guys have my screen? Yeah. Okay. So the premise for this project is that uh, rights claims around us in the US. It took me like three minutes of searching around in Google News to find a handful of examples uh, from current politics about people making rights-based claims for and against their different policy preferences. Right, so just here on the screen, we have a couple of examples of uh, religious claims and free speech claims being advanced as objections to different responses to the ongoing pandemic. Uh, we have an example of religious claims being made both for and against uh, the new Texas abortion law uh, and free expression rights uh, on campus suggesting what those rights might uh, require of a whole variety of, of policies on, on college campuses. Right. So if you follow American politics, really at all, you will be encountering rights claims pretty frequently. Um, of course, in the sort of the American ideal, I guess, is that rights and liberties are supposed to be universal in their application, right? We all enjoy rights equally as, you know, one of the, um, you know, one of the, one of the benefits of, of citizenship. But any political uh, observer can tell you that that has essentially never uh, been true in practice in the US, right? We know that there are lots of uh, ways in which the enjoyment of rights is, is unequal, right? um, But the, this particular research that I'm gonna present to you today is about a similar but related uh, question, uh, which has to do with public opinion towards those civil rights and civil liberties. Um, so we know that Americans hold the idea of civil rights and liberties in pretty high esteem in the abstract, but I wonder, Right? And what the, the, the question that motivated this is whether uh, people like in their in their views about how rights and liberties should work in the US, if they um, you know, kind of expect that rights and liberties should be applied differently to different sorts of people. Right? So the question that motivates this, um, this project uh, that I've been working on now for a couple of years is our views, right, our public opinions about civil rights and liberties contingent on the identity of the group or the person that's exercising a right or liberty in some particular application, right? So in other words, you know, a person might think that like in the abstract, like I really like free speech or something, but that doesn't mean that that person will necessarily have like free speech absolutist views in, you know, in different potential applications of a, of a, a sort of broad principle of freedom of speech, right? So, uh, we want to know in this project if the identity of the person in the group that's exercising some right matters for how people perceive those rights. And to briefly preview um, my argument that I'm going to develop here over the next few minutes, we find uh, at this point a, a contingent yes, right? Yes, attitudes about the groups um, who are uh, exercising a right do condition civil rights and liberties views. This is true for at least some people under at least some conditions. And in the ongoing work that I'm going to describe at the end of the talk, um, I'm going to talk some about how um, we're trying to figure out the, the who and the what of those conditions, right? So when exactly does this, um, does this conditional relationship come into play? But just a very little bit of, of um, I guess the intellectual background of the project. 
Um, so as I've already said, we know that um, in the abstract, Americans have pretty strong pro-civil rights and civil liberties attitudes. But we also know that those, um, those attitudes are malleable under at least some conditions. Um, a very prominent example of this from the relatively recent past um, comes from like a whole bunch of research uh, that, that came out after the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Uh, so what, uh, what a large number of studies found uh, there was that Americans were uh, pretty willing to see civil liberties curtailed in response to a perceived security threat. Um, so Americans were willing to see their own rights curtailed, but they were um, particularly willing to see the rights of certain minority groups curtailed. Right? In that case, uh, it was people that they thought were responsible for the security threat. Right? So many Americans were particularly likely to say, you know, it might be reasonable to curtail the rights of Muslims, of immigrants, uh, for example, uh, in the wake of 9-11. Okay. So strong pro-civil liberties attitudes and abstract, but you know not uh, not absolute pro-civil liberties attitudes by any stretch. And sort of separately, there's a very large body of literature in political science and sociology and psychology that uh, that shows that views towards social groups are centrally important to public opinion formation on basically all topics. Um, and by that, I mean that many people form their attitudes about a given policy or about some issue that they, they have an opinion on, on the basis of the groups they think are affected by the policy or the issue in question. Right? So people are um, forming their opinions very often based on whether they like the group that is going to benefit from a policy or uh, whether they dislike the group that's going to pay the cost of a policy and those sorts of considerations, right? That's foundational to public opinion on basically everything. Okay? So in some ways, the idea that, that civil rights and liberties are absolute and that they might be viewed in that way um, in the public mind sort of stands um, in, in contrast to what we know about, about public opinion generally, right? Uh, I'm going to put it a little differently. It would actually be pretty surprising given what we know about public opinion if Americans had sort of unconditional pro-civil liberties views. So that sort of background is what, uh, what led us to this research topic. Uh, and just based on this research that I was just discussing, our expectation here is that group affect will powerfully condition uh, attitudes towards rights and liberties. Okay. So, to test this expectation and to answer the, the question I set out a few minutes ago, um, we designed a, a series of survey experiments uh, wherein we manipulated the identity of the person or group whose rights were ostensibly being infringed in some scenario that we presented in the survey. So I'm gonna show you an example of, of how we did this um, because I think it's maybe easier to see than to to just kind of get in the abstract if you're not familiar with survey experiments. So what we did was we, we devised some pretty basic scenarios and uh, presented them to survey respondents. So this is the first one that I'm gonna talk about. This is an experiment dealing with free speech, free assembly, uh, protests, or right, First Amendment issues. And um, respondents to the survey were presented with a vignette describing um, a, thing that ostensibly happened in politics. So what this says is earlier this year, a small contingent of a larger group's rally damaged property at several businesses near the rally. In response, the city has decided to refuse permits to the group, um, uh, sorry, refuse to issue permits to the group to hold any future rallies. Right, so that was all the information that was provided to them. Then we asked, do you think that the city's refusal to allow the group to hold rallies is a violation of the group's free speech and free assembly, right? So very, very basic scenario. And then do you think this is a rights violation? We have two other versions of this exact same scenario where the only thing we vary is the identity of the group in question. Right? So in the one that, that I read, we just said group. And so it's totally abstract. The person can bring whatever view they might have that just says group. 
in the two treatment uh, arms, we tell the respondent who the group was. Right? We say a small contingent of a larger Black Lives Matter rally or a small contingent of a larger Make America Great Again rally. Okay? So we tell them who the group is. And all the respondents in the survey were randomly assigned to one of these three groups. So that's where the, the experimental component comes in. So th this is the, the basic idea for how all three of the experiments I'm gonna talk about today work. Um, and so the one that I just showed you is this experiment one, which is the public demonstration issue. There was a baseline that will be the comparison group, right? That was where we didn't specify who the group was. And the treatment arms for Make America Great Again or Black Lives Matter. Um, the second experiment I'm gonna walk through, I won't show you the full vignette, but it's a gun rights um, issue. So what we had there was uh, a vignette describing uh, a militant group who was being preemptively disarmed by the national government in the baseline treatment. We didn't tell them who the group was. In the uh, treatment arms, we identified it as either a white nationalist group, uh, Posse Comitatus, or a black nationalist group, Black Panthers. Uh, and then the final experiment I'm gonna talk about today we took the uh, example of property rights, so those protected by the Fifth Amendment, and um, we showed people a situation where the government was using uh, its eminent domain power to take people's houses for public use. Um, in the baseline group, we didn't identify the people whose property was being taken, but then in the treatment uh, arms, we identified them as uh, you know, people living in a mostly white neighborhood, a mostly black neighborhood, or a mostly immigrant neighborhood. Yeah. So that's the, the basic idea of how each of these works. So we present them with a scenario. We randomly assign them to uh, like what sort of person or group is being um, you know, the target of the governmental action in a given case. Then we ask them, do you think this thing that happened is a violation of the person or the group's rights? Yeah. So that question at the end um, serves as our, our dependent variable. Right? This is the, their views about the, the rights and infringement question. Um, but recall that like, uh, what we're really interested in is the potential uh, moderating effect that group affect has. So we're not just interested in the differences, potential differences across treatment. In fact, that's not actually our primary interest. Our primary interest is how affect towards the, related, or the relevant groups might moderate response to treatment, right? condition response to treatment. So... Um, we also measured affect towards a whole bunch of different groups. Um, we measured um, using feeling thermometers, which are pretty standard in, in social sciences. Um, we measured affect towards uh, white people and African-Americans and Muslims and Republicans and white supremacists and the Supreme Court, right? All these different like types of groups. Um, and we did that so that we would have measures for all the groups that we needed, but also so that um, we wouldn't be tipping respondents off about like, like what we were trying to get at. So we, we showed them these thermometers in random order and in random groups. Um, but those, uh, those measures from the filling thermometers are going to be the, the key independent variable along with treatment. Okay? And then we also measured lots of other stuff, uh, social and demographic things like education and income, uh, you know, partisanship and ideology, uh, age and race and gender, and so on and so forth. That stuff doesn't enter the analysis because this is experimental uh, research. Like we don't we don't need that in the analysis, um, but we have it so we can show robustness and do randomization checks and that sort of thing. Okay, so that's the the setup of the the research. Um, the data uh, that go into the analysis that I'm about to show you come from a survey that was fielded by SSI Research Now. It's a major research firm, uh, survey research firm. Um, these data come from June of 2018. So it's a couple of years old now. Uh, our sample was just over a thousand people. The sample was nationally representative of voting age Americans. Uh, so it's a good high quality representative sample, but it wasn't a perfect mirror of the census. Uh, so, we, uh, in the analysis that I'm gonna show you, uh, we apply survey weights so that the final analysis will reflect the, the uh, genuine like census trends. Um, so we weighted 
on um, age, race, and gender to, to make adjustments in our sample uh, towards the census using the 2018 census estimates as, as the benchmark uh, that is. Uh, though I should note before I get into the analysis that uh, none of the findings that I have uh, that I'm going to show you change if we don't apply those survey weights, right? So the, the findings, in other words, don't like crucially hinge on the, the survey weights. Okay. So in the analysis of these three experiments, I'm going to walk through these one at a time. Um, and um, if I'll go through the first one more slowly and then the second two more quickly since they're, um, they're very similar in, in setup. And I think we'll require less explanation as we go. So the first thing I'm showing you is um, just the kind of the, the net um, civil liberties view across everyone within a given treatment arm. So what we have here on the y-axis is the proportion of people in a given treatment arm who think the thing they read about was a rights violation. Right? So this, um, this one is the, the rally scenario that I, um, that I talked about a few slides ago. We, showed you the, the vignettes. Um, and then on the x-axis, it's just denoting which treatment group we're talking about. So this is that baseline control where the group wasn't identified. The center bar is um, those in the Black Lives Matter treatment. And the bar at right is the Make America Great Again treatment. Okay. So we see are some like modest differences in the, like the, the net proportion, I'm sorry, the gross proportion um, of, of folks in those treatments saying the thing was a rights violation, but these differences are not statistically meaningful. That is, um, people's views uh, about whether this was a rights violation don't really change across the treatments. But as I said, our, our theory is about the reaction to the treatment uh, being conditioned by group affect. So here, um, what I'm gonna show you next with each of these is the actual uh, like key test of, of our expectations. So I'm gonna show you uh, marginal effects plots. Um, and what these are going to show uh, is within a given treatment. So I'm gonna show you the Black Lives Matter treatment first, and then the Make America Great Again treatment second. They show the proportion of people who are in that treatment group who are predicted to have believed that um, the, the action they read about was a rights violation. Um, conditioned on their feelings toward the group they read about. So here we have uh, on the x-axis, their feelings toward Black Lives Matter, right? So people who have very negative views of Black Lives Matter will be depicted at the, at the left. People who have very warm views towards Black Lives Matter will be depicted at the right. And people who are in the middle will be depicted in the middle, right? So the expectation here is that we should get a positively sloped line, right? The more warmly you feel toward Black Lives Matter, the more likely you should be to say that this is a rights violation. The more you dislike Black Lives Matter, the more likely you should be to say this is not a rights violation. And that's what we found, right? We see that this, um, that's, you know, respondents' views about being denied this permit, like whether that denial amounts to a rights violation is powerfully conditioned by how much the person likes Black Lives Matter, right? How warmly they feel toward that group. We repeat this with the um, Make America Great Again group, right? We should have the same expectation that we should have a positively sloped line. And that's, again, what we see, right? Basically a mirror of what we got in the Black Lives Matter treatment. The more you like Trump and the MAGA movement, the more likely you are to view a permit denial as a violation of the group's free speech or you know, free expression rights. Okay. So in experiment one, we get pretty strong evidence that group affect is conditioning this civil liberty view. So onto the second experiment. Uh, this one, again, concerns the Second Amendment, so gun rights, uh, and here was concerning uh, a group being preemptively disarmed by the national government. So here, um, what we have, uh, again, is the is gross responses uh, to, uh, to the, uh, the government action in question. 
And we see again that there's really no difference across treatments. Right, the people in the in the um, Black Panthers treatment were a little bit more likely uh, to say that that disarming the group was a rights violation, but that difference across the control or compared to the control or the the uh, white nationalist treatment was not significantly meaningful. Uh, I'm sorry, statistically meaningful. And, but again, what we were really interested in is this um, potential for a conditioning effect across. Um, uh, you know, or, I'm sorry, within the, the treatments. So the conditioning effect of group affect. So I'm again showing you marginal effects plots. Um, Want to note here that this one, um, the y-axis isn't just uh, feeling toward the, the group. I probably would have been more straightforward for me to have shown you that one because then it would have looked just like the, the first one I showed you. Um, but here what we're actually doing is, is taking a difference in relative warmth towards whites and blacks. Um, so this is a, a fairly standard way that people like measure, um, uh, just measure like anti-black affect in, in practice. It's just like the relative rating of, of whites and blacks. So that's what we've done here. And what that means is that we should expect in the black treatment group, the line to run negatively and in the white treatment group, the line to run positively. So this, um, this finding that even though this one's running this way, that is consistent with our expectations. Um, though the effect here is not nearly as pronounced, that is the effect in the black treatment is not nearly as pronounced as the effect was in the white treatment. Um, we don't have a good explanation for why that effect isn't as, um, isn't as pronounced across the two treatment arms, isn't like equally pronounced across the two treatment arms. Um, so we consider this like mixed support for the theory here in the second, uh, second study, right? strong and clear support in one arm, but you know, uh, more ambiguous support in, in a, the second arm of the treatment. Okay. But again, still like the signs are in the right direction. It's is consistent with our expectations. All right. Finally, uh, the property rights experiment. So here we had three treatment arms uh, instead of just two. Uh, right. And this is the, uh, the scenario here is the government using eminent domain to take people's houses for public use. Um, one thing to take from this first, this top line, is that uh, this is really a huge portion of the respondents across all treatments viewed the government doing this as a rights violation. Uh, there, there were no meaningful differences across group, but what we do have is something of a potential ceiling effect that we're looking at here, because there's just like not a lot of room to, to move when, you know, 85, 90% of the, the sample is opposed to, to the thing that happened. Okay. But again, um, we're looking like what we're really interested in is how group affect might be conditioning people's response here. Um, this one is going to be like the first experiment I showed you, where um, all of the uh, uh, all of the the predicted probabilities should run uphill. Right? They should all be positively signed. So across the three treatments, we get more or less what we expect and in that insofar as all the treatments are running in the positive direction, but the conditional effect in the white group and the immigrant group are pretty muted. And in, in fact, these are not statistically distinguishable from no effect of, uh, of group effect. Um, so we get a strong effect that's consistent with our expectations for uh, folks in the black treatment group, but, but not in the others. Um, so this is the, the most, um, this experiment of the three is the most mixed with respect to our expectations. Okay. All right. So um, to, to summarize this first part of the research, um, the findings are largely but not entirely consistent with our expectations. Right? We are finding that racial group affect and group affect generally does condition support for civil liberties, but that effect was not consistent across uh, all the treatment arms within a given experiment, right? So we got unambiguous support in experiment one. But in experiment two, we saw different effect sizes across the two treatment arms. And in experiment three, we saw no, null effects in two treatment arms and uh, a strong uh, you know, effect consistent with expectations in one treatment arm. They're the, uh, the, the black treatment arm. And we don't have a great explanation for why that's the case. I'm gonna offer a couple of ideas here in a couple of slides um, that pose the question for the group. If you have thoughts about why we might be seeing this, I'd be happy to hear them. 
right? So this project is um, still in, in progress. Uh, the, the three studies, the three experiments that I just uh, presented to you, like th those are out and, and published, but, um, but the, the larger project is still, um, uh, you know, still in progress. So one thing that, that we're thinking about is um, other sorts of groups, right? Uh, what besides race and ethnicity and, you know, political groups that are, uh, that are in our politics, like coded as having like a strong, like racial uh, connotation, uh, what other sorts of groups would we expect to see this for? Um, so we posit that we should see the same sorts of things for different religious groups, um, for members of different like gender sexuality groups, and even partisan groups, right? Like we, we expect that people will be much more likely to see um, a rights violation, some government action, when it's against their co-partisans than when it's against the, the other party, right? Um, so we're, we're intending to get into to this stuff in, in future work. And in fact, we have a large survey in the field right now with Qualtrics, uh, which is another survey firm. Uh, with a, uh, We're expecting a sample size of about 2,000 to 2,200 people. Um, this one's going to focus in on religious liberty. So instead of, you know, kind of being a, uh, a smattering of different, um, different rights and liberties issues, we're going to hone in on religious liberty. Uh, we should... Uh, we designed four uh, experiments that are, take the same form as the ones I just discussed, um, but again, with all of them being a potential violation of a religious right. Um, and here we're experimentally manipulating the group again, but um, here we'll either not identify the group or we'll say, you know, this was an evangelical Christian church, you know, or this was a, a Muslim man or, you know, a, a Jewish group, a Jewish synagogue or something like that, all right? So we'll be identifying the, the religious identity of um, the, the person or the group affected. We're also planning a follow-up looking at partisanship. Um, and really importantly, and I think this might go back to why we got the sort of mixed effects in um, a couple of the experiments that I showed you, we're starting to, to think about how, uh, what we need to do to get at the intersection of different identity groups um, that we might be uh, inducing people to think about when we're manipulating group identity in these experiments. Um, and what I mean by that is um, because we're interested in uh, the extent to which group attitudes are conditioning response to treatment, it's crucial for us to be measuring the, uh, the respondent's affect toward the right group. Right? But uh, identity is like a bundle of things, right? It's not, not a single thing. So for example, in the study that we have in the field right now, we're interested in uh, looking at these religious groups, but when people think about evangelical Christians here in the US, like evangelical Christian is a, is a bundle of things. It's not just like, oh, here's this like abstract category of you know, people with certain religious beliefs, right? They tend to think of those of evangelicals as being white and Republican among other things, right? So if some people primarily think of evangelical and white, but other people think primarily of evangelical and Republican, then just measuring um, affect towards evangelicals might be missing a lot of the important work that's going on in group affect. Uh, you know, so if, a, if a, some respondents, if, if a particular respondent has strongly, um, you know, pro, you know, strongly, uh, what am I trying to say? Has warm attitudes towards whites as a group, but has generally negative attitudes towards Republicans, then both of those things may matter in how they think about evangelicals, right? Uh, you know, similarly, if um, someone in our, uh, in the study we've got in the field, you know, if we say this is, um, you know, this is a, a Muslim person, then people don't generally think about like a white person, right? Some people will think about, um, you know, some people will think about immigrants and some people will think about um, uh, you know, Arabs or something like that in particular, right? So you, you don't necessarily know what people are, are bringing when, um, when they're thinking about a particular group. And that, that can matter quite a bit, right? Um, so I, from the studies that I presented here, uh, I mentioned um, that, you know, in the first one we used Black Lives Matter. Well, so this study was in the field in 2018 before Black Lives Matter was 
as polarizing as it is today. Um, but you know, today, depending on where you get your news, you might think about any Black Lives Matter being anything from, you know, uh, an, an interest and in activist organization, you know, that's largely by and for um, African Americans, or you might think of it as you know, uh, an arm of the Democratic Party, because you think about Democrats, right? If you get your news from certain places, you might think communist, right? So these, these groups that we're using are like fairly laden, and we're trying to figure out how to pull that apart so that we can uh, more precisely measure and capture the ways that, that group affect may be mattering. All right, so if you guys have thoughts about that, I would love to hear them because this is a, a hard problem we're finding because it seems pretty artificial in our treatments to say, you know, this is a white Muslim or something like that, right? The, the, the treatments sort of don't pass the smell test when we try to like be really precise about these things so that we can more tightly control um, the group identity. Um, so anyway, in conclusion, um, we are finding that Americans have, you know, strong pro-civil liberties attitudes in the abstract. But these um, attitudes in practice are strongly conditioned by group affect, uh, at least for some people, and at least under some conditions, but we're having trouble so far nailing down the who of those people and the what of those conditions. So, you know, as ever, more work is needed on this. We need more samples and more populations. We need to think about more groups than just the handful that I talked about today. Uh, we need to do this for more like rights issues, right? Free press, uh, rights the accused, and so on. Um, religious rights, I talked a little bit about. Um, but we also need to do this in like more scenarios. So, like, even within rights, you know, I wouldn't draw broad sweeping conclusions about free speech or free assembly rights from the one survey experiment that, that I did, right? We need lots of them. Um, we need lots of free speech, different scenarios to sort of. Um, you know, triangulate um, this across like studies and, and so forth. So that is all I have for you. Uh, I appreciate everyone's time and I uh, look forward to your comments and questions, suggestions.